everybody hi good morning everybody welcome welcome to our session about local to global and global to local the uh, right to grow and uh, swa session of the world water week 2022 and uh, we have an audience here in the room welcome everybody and we also have an audience online and this is why we're uh, and, and there's the camera. Hi, everybody at home. Thanks for joining us. Um, it's almost like a TV show here. So, um, so that's why I'm wearing a mic and, uh, and two of the speakers are as well. We also have a microphone, a hand mic. Uh, so the third speaker will, uh, will use that. The hand mic is here. And this is not for us in the room. It's simply for those back uh, behind the screen to hear what we're saying while we have our interaction. Okay, and I'm, I'm the moderator of today's session. My name is Tessa Terpstra. I'm the, uh, the head of advocacy at the uh, Save the Children Netherlands team in, back in The Hague. And we're very proud partners uh, with our coalition in the Right to Grow program and in, in today's session. Um, so what are we going to do? We'll first have a, uh, we'll have a question for the audience, both on screen, and here in the room, um, and then we'll I'll uh, I'll run you through the program. So may I please have the icebreaker? Could you could you tell us either in the chat or on the post-its that were handed out why do community voices in decision making matter? Why do we need them? Please give us your thoughts, and we'll come back to this during the session. So I'll give you two minutes. Everybody has a pen and a post-it. And you can post the post-its here on the flip chart, give them to me or put them up on the uh, glass cabinet. And uh, for the viewers at home, please type in your, your ideas on the chat and we'll get back to them. Very silent. There's a lot of thinking. Yes, please put them up here. Thanks, Lise Lot. So scary. <laughs> no, not at all. You? Super, thank you. Okay, there's one more. Super, thanks for this. Okay, thanks a lot. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to these in the course of this session. And feel free, if, if you have any other thoughts during the session, please, uh, please feel free and put them up there. And in the chat, of course. Okay, so today we're going to, to talk about three essentials of this, uh, of this session. We're talking about communities taking the lead, communities in the driver's seat. That's what it's all about. And we've heard a lot about this over the past couple of days at the Stockholm Water Week or World Water Week as we are now. Um, but we're going to talk about a more few more concrete examples of what that means uh, in our mind and share them with you and, and how this works at the local level and at the global level and back. So bringing voices to international fora is something we're going to talk about and working in partnerships, SDG 17. Now, this session will be having um, a, a short film from, uh, from Mali, then we'll have a presentation about uh, from, from Uganda, 
and then uh, we'll have a panel and we'll talk more a bit more about these uh, about these topics. Um, what I would like to to tell you a bit more about uh, Right to Grow and and uh, SWA, uh, Sanitation and Water for All. So Right to Grow is a five year program. It's a coalition uh, of uh, internet of of local organizations, Dutch organizations, working with in strategic partnership um, with uh, organizations in the field. And the idea is to have children reach their full potential by improving services and working with communities to upscale the wash nutrition nexus and have communities and decision makers work together. So better policies are being tailored towards the community's needs. So there are two main components of Right to Grow, strengthening local voices through uh, helping communities invest and uh, work better to collect their own data and their own stories on that nutrition and wash and to hold, to help them hold their most relevant and nearest government officials to account. So that's strengthening local voices. We'll talk more about that today. The other is strengthening partnerships. So these are partnerships between local communities and their governments to make a joint analysis of what is needed. Sustainable, uh, sorry, sanitation and water for all is it the United Nations hosted global multi-stakeholder partnership. So this is, sorry, this is still right to grow. It explains it more. And this is for sanitation and water for all. Um, it's a United Nation hosted global multi-stakeholder partnership and it's created to achieve the vision of sanitation, water and hygiene for all, always and everywhere. And it consists of governments, ut utilities and regulators, support agencies such as UN agencies or development banks, civil society, research and ac academia and private sector. So those are the six constituencies of SWA. And it's impressive because within a decade, it has grown with more than 300 partners, among which 80 governments. So those are the two, uh, two hosts uh, of today, these, uh, these two organizations or initiatives, and uh, we'll hear more about that today. Okay, let's start the, uh, the Mali film, please. D'abord, l'élaboration des politiques doit être basée sur des faits. Et aujourd'hui, les faits des communautés, surtout les besoins essentiels des communautés les plus pauvres, doit être traduit dans toutes nos politiques. Ça a été le cas dans la politique nationale de l'hydrique, où on a pris en charge les questions de la sécurité sanitaire des ressources en eau. Et ça a été aussi le cas de la stratégie pour hygiène, assainissement et nutrition, où la pauvreté et l'accès à l'eau ont été les deux piliers pour prendre les besoins des communautés les plus pauvres, en particulier les jeunes, les femmes et surtout les femmes en état de qui aujourd'hui, le fait d'avoir des ressources en eau distantes fait qu'ils perdent économiquement, ils perdent en santé, ils perdent aussi même en espérant de vie. Voici pourquoi ces besoins ont été pris en compte dans la politique nationale de l'hydraulique et la politique nationale de l'assainissement avec l'intervention de la nutrition. Merci. Ce qui a été une des recommandations phares de Jakarta, c'est la revivabilité mutuelle. Cela veut dire que le niveau central a mandat de faire l'orientation politique, mais le niveau des communes aussi a mandat de donner les données factuelles pour influencer la politique. De ce fait, nous devons travailler fondamentalement avec les communautés à la base, surtout les plus pauvres, qui soient impliqués dans l'entité de gouvernance pour que leurs besoins puissent influencer nos politiques. Et je pense que sur ce fait a été le cas dans la politique nationale de l'hydraulique et dans la politique nationale de l'assainissement, qui sont les deux politiques par de la transformation du lien entre la nutrition et le wash 
qui a aujourd'hui une prière pour transformer les cas nécessaires de notre place. Merci. Il faut se couper par rapport, vous le savez, le Mali a eu l'occasion de produire euh, un fiche, une fiche pays, un document qui devait récapituler l'ensemble des préoccupations mondiales et de l'économie. Et les quelques préoccupations ont été notamment présentées pour le Jakarta. Au cours des résolutions finales, nous avons su que les préoccupations ont été prises en compte. À titre d'exemple, il est de souhaiter que l'une des résolutions majeures qui a été prise en compte, c'est la prise en compte sur le plan financier des préoccupations, des besoins essentiels d'une communauté, tant au niveau des financements que au niveau de la persécution. Et un autre aspect qui a été pris en compte, c'est également les questions de liberté mutuelle qui invoquent aussi des questions de droits humains. Et nous estimons que ce que nous avons indiqué au niveau de notre pays et qui a été présenté au niveau de cette, de cette rencontre a été notamment pris en compte. Et ceci s'est traduit comme étant la prise en compte des droits d'accès aux services au Roche et également les questions de nutrition. Thank you. So those were some of the examples that we saw in, uh, in Mali. And the, uh, the meeting uh, they were talking about is the meeting organized by, uh, by SWA in, uh, in 2022 in Jakarta, hosted by the, uh, the Indonesian government. And we'll talk more about that um, from, our, from our speakers. Um, so first of all, I would like to, uh, to invite uh, uh, Helena Kisuja. She is the director of the Community Integrated Development Initiative in Uganda, and she is the Right to Grow lead in Uganda as well. And Helena is going to share some, some case studies and stories with us about local to global and global to local. Helena, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tessa, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, um, greetings from Uganda, the Pearl of Africa, and uh, today we are talking about uh, bringing communities, uh, voices from the communities to the global arena, to the regional arena, as right to grow in terms of championing the voices. We have had a number of things that we have undertaken since uh, the meeting in Jakarta. First of all, in terms of what was the message that we're taking to Jakarta? One of the key things that Try to Grow is passionate about is that we must ensure that the communities are heard and there are local solutions, and there's, that there's also multi-sectoral working and approaches. So in terms of uh, the messages that we brought to Jakarta, one of the key things as a country, first of all, we want to thank SWA. For the very first time, we had an opportunity to have our ministers vote and health come together. Mm -hmm. And as a country, that is helping us build momentum. In terms of the commitments that we made, uh, for instance, we have agreed that as a country, we want to have uh, a national action plan that is WASH centered. We already want, have one for agriculture. So we want to have an adaptation plan for WASH within the country. And that is going to help us bring the, the climate change and wash nexus uh, into the corporate. So what we are actually uh, doing in terms of uh, priorities, we have looked at uh, how do we ensure that uh, we build the political will in terms of ensuring that the politicians, the local leaders are able to provide adequate financing. What we have uh, realized uh, since Jakarta is that, uh, for instance, within this new financial year, there has been an attempt by government to bring down resources to local governments, to the district of local governments in terms of climate financing. What has been happening is that we have been getting a lot of financing that has been actually stopping at the ministerial level. Yet the action around climate change, the need for uh, climate resilient wash infrastructure is actually within the communities. So we are seeing that shift. And uh, I think we, we, are, we, are, we are proud that we are taking that as a, as a country. The other aspect has been uh, around how do we ensure that uh, we, we bring the, the different stakeholders uh, speak together. 
right to grow on the day of the African child was able to uh, hold or host uh, what we call the children's parliament. And the essence was that we have stories from the young people. And uh, this was coming uh, at, the, at the onset or of a food security crisis within the country because the prices were going up. And uh, while listening to young people, children actually talking about the portions of the food that they are getting in school is not adequate. And therefore you already have issues around there. There are issues of sanitation because as a country, we are grappling with the uh, sanitation levels. If you look at uh, people who are actually uh, 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 accessing basic sanitation, we are talking about uh, in the ranges of 30 and 19% uh, in other places. And so these voices are very, very important for us and they're very, very important for the, for the, for the decision makers. Within this space, we're also able to bring together the parliamentarians. We had the parliamentarians from the Parliamentary Watch Forum, but we also had those from the Food and Nutrition uh, Security Forum. And the idea is that we can have all these people that are actually championing different causes, but actually coming together and speaking together about the issues that we are talking about. In terms of my sectoral approach, which was one of the key things that we actually took to Jakarta, but also it's one of the things that SWA has been pushing. Uh, I know Serena will talk about the MAM, that mutual accountability mechanism that we all speak to each other, that we are all accountable to each other. As a right to grow, one of the things that we are trying to cascade downwards, we have structures that we have as a, as a country, for instance, uh, if, you took, if you look at nutrition, we have the district nutrition coordination committees. These are actually at the lower local government level. And uh, we have worked in terms of orienting them and also trying to make sure that the work they are doing is actually not just nutrition centered, but they can actually speak to other sectors like education, like water, like, uh, like health uh, in the bigger context. And the idea is that uh, uh, we want to push what the health practitioners are actually always talking about, the quantum of health. So if we are talking about, if we want to ensure that every child has lives up to their full potential, we must be mindful of the first 1,000 days. And the first 1,000 days are inclusive of making sure that this, this skilled health care provision at the birth that the children are born within the health care facilities. We also want to make sure that the health facilities where these children are born actually have water so that we don't have infections at the beginning of the life of the children. We also want to make sure that the mothers can actually get information about the nutrition and the feeding and the breastfeeding and all the things that they have to do. So then we also want this to go on. So Right to Grow also has partners that are actually working within schools. For instance, in Uganda, the movement uh, for community-led has, you know, has partners that are actually working in schools. And the idea is that from child, then you also have through school education. How, how sure are we that we have, you know, people who are knowledgeable? How do we ensure that we have young people who are knowledgeable about WASH, about health, about the importance of nutrition, so that we, we with this, we are trying to break the silos within the decision makers, but we're also trying to break the silos within the people who own the knowledge from the children, from the mothers, from the young people, and from all the practitioners. So as right to grow in terms of multi-sectoral approach, we are actually doing it uh, to front from the, from the right holders who want to make sure that we leave no one behind in terms of knowledge, but also within the decision makers, we are actually trying to do that. So that speaks to the fact that uh, when we generate this information, when we generate this knowledge that we bring to the global level, we can actually also have avenues that can actually take back this knowledge uh, to the people in terms of commitment. As a country, I think uh, there is something that we talk about how, what is the importance of, uh, having these discussions at the global level, but also what is the implication, for instance, to a country like Uganda? 
I was sharing with people yesterday that for the very first time in a very long time, uh, the president of Uganda uh, has been speaking about climate change in a very long time. And the reason was because in COP26, there were discussions around, about in the next 20 years, fossil fuels are no more. And Uganda is a country that has actually been, you know, we, we are working around the oil and gas sector and we are just hoping within the next 20 years we are on the market. But by the time we get to the market, then it's no more. So how does this now change the perspective of the political leadership? So we plug into these spaces and these opportunities. So now if we are, as people who are working on WASH, if we are, if we are people who are working on nutrition, this is the time now to bring the WASH climate nexus to the president because now the president at this particular moment recognizes that we have an issue around climate change and action has to be taken. So in terms of messaging, in terms of positioning ourselves as a, a right to grow, we have an opportunity when we are developing our WASH adaptation plan, then we can actually speak to the president because he will be able to listen. And we know in places where we come from, in terms of the budget and in terms of the decision making around budgets, the president has a big say. The president has a big say because uh, uh, the budget is a big political tool that is uh, used within the country. So as Right to Grow, we are very, very excited to have this opportunity to have this movement from the local and also going to the global. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Helena. Um, so you so you spoke a bit when you mentioned Jakarta, right? Yes. This is the uh, the, the meeting that was organized by uh, by SWA, right? Yes. In uh, in Indonesia, and the the very nice thing about this meeting was that it was ministers from different ministries, right? Yeah. Who so so the multi sectoral approach that you are uh, talking about indeed happened with these uh, several ministers, yeah. but also the uh, the constituencies that we spoke about earlier were there as well, right? Absolutely. The, the, the communities and... Absolutely. How did that work? And for Uganda's case, in terms of the commitments that we have as a country, worked. I think we are the best people in terms of uh, uh, taking up the MAM approach. In terms of uh, writing the commitments or making the commitments for the country, all the constituencies came together. As civil society, we consulted our people and then we generated the issues, the issues that we, we thought or the communities thought we needed to prioritize issues around climate change financing and making sure that communities can be able to access uh, infrastructure that is uh, uh, climate resilient. Mm -hmm. We had uh, issues around, you know, the inclusive participation that the communities are able to participate and you know offer solutions or be part of the solutions or offer knowledge that they have that is existent and resident with them so we had that opportunity within the uh, our constituents as civil society but then we also had an opportunity to come together with government and the private sector to be able to agree on the commitments as a country so when we have the commitments that were taken to Jakarta as Uganda as a country, there are commitments that we have all subscribed to. And therefore, each one of us has a responsibility to go down and cascade and make sure that these commitments are working, but also that we can actually take them forward, like we are bringing them back forward today in this global agenda. Right. Yeah. So there were there were representatives from communities in U in from Uganda, in Jakarta, speaking with these ministers. Yes. Right. And the U Ugandan and other ministers from other countries, they they made commitments that they took back to their country, to their cabinet to actually implement. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. And how many countries were there in uh, were represented? We yeah. had a, we had about 50 or 60 there plus. Yeah. 33, yeah. 33 countries. That's impressive. And the majority. 
majority yeah. from Africa. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. If there are any questions about this, um, about what Helena has been saying from the from the audience on uh, on screen or in on site. Yeah, I have a question. Um, because you say um, you try to uh, develop partnerships and focus on SDG 17. Um, to what extent do you see a role for the private sector? The private sector has many solutions out there that can actually contribute to uh, leapfrogging and boosting SDG 6. And I think together we can also form useful partnerships. So to what extent do you see a role for the private sector in these kind of programs? And maybe you can introduce yourself. You're from private sector? Uh, yes, I'm from the private sector, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, my name is uh, Lisa and I started a social enterprise called Nazava Water Filters and we make WHO certified water filters to empower local rural communities to purify their water and make it safe to drink. So we aim very high for SDG 6 and we want to contribute to safely managed drinking water to ensure that we really can prevent malnutrition and stunting to ensure that children drink E. coli free water. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm based in Indonesia. Um, okay. Capital is Jakarta. I'm Excellent. curious to know if there's anybody else from Indonesia here in the room, because I feel a little bit outnumbered as we are the fourth <laughs> biggest country in the world. But okay. that's another discussion. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Role for private sector, Helena. There is a role for the private sector. One, because in terms of research and efficient use of resources, they are number one. So. We actually need those solutions with the private sector. But my call to the private sector is that uh, doing product development, we need, we need to protest. We need to continuously have conversation with the users of these products that we are developing. So that, such that the technology we, we develop is appropriate. It's usable. It's, it's meeting the needs of these people. So the private se sector is very, very critical. and. Uh, we, are, we all know that in, if we are going to reach the SDG 6, then we need resources. These resources are not there. These resources can't come from, you know, from government. So the private sector is a big, big player that we actually want to be on board. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Helena. Another question. My name is Henk Holtzlag from the Smart Center Group, which is a group of water training centers. Um, <clears throat> my question is, were there also recommendations for family wells? Because we all know that we want to improve the water supply systems, the rural water pipe systems, et cetera, with solar pumps. But was there also attention for how to improve household level water supply? Yeah. I think the importance of household water supply cannot be underscored more because one of the key challenges we find in, uh, in terms of uh, improving access to water uh, in places like, for instance, Uganda, is that if you're talking about uh, availability of a water source, we would count that we have a water source there, but then there's not actual use of that water source because probably the women will not find there the water all the time they need to, to get that water from there. So we need to actually start pushing that we have those water supply systems that can actually bring water to the premises where the women and children can actually access and have their time free to go to school and also in, improve their well-being. really. Yesterday we had a session where people are talking about mental health around collection of water and it's a real thing it's a big thing that is happening because you know children have to first go to the world and then go to the school and then you know a lot of things happen so it's a good thing it's a it's a big thing that should actually be on the agenda now that it's not just a matter of having water within the 500 meters can we actually have water at household level yeah thank you Any other questions? Riyad, please. Hello, my name is Riyad. I'm from Bangladesh. I work as a country director of Max Foundation, also working with Right to Grow. The question is actually, I guess, a complementation and also a question. So when we work 
for the children, then it is very important to know who are these children, mm. where they are located, and how they are located. Mm. And this information is very important to get to the government, get to the practitioners, get to the private sector. And without the information, it's very difficult to make any decision mm. and to ensure the participation. Mm. So that's why when we are talking about the uh, participation of people for raising voice, then it's very important that how information are used mm. to shape this system mm. and to direct this work. So that's why uh, my question in uh, that is in Uganda, how this uh, data are using to make this happen. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Uh, one of the gaps that we have is, first of all, having data and data that is reliable and data that is timely. It's a big challenge. It's a big challenge. And we all know that if you're talking about government and most importantly, if you're talking about the private sector, they actually need to have data that is timely and data that is reliable such that they can you know, make their projections uh, very well. So one of the challenges that we have as a country, but we are working within the last commitment uh, of uh, within the previous SMM, as a, as a country, we committed to have a, an MIS system. And uh, with support from UNICEF, the country is actually trying to roll out that uh, MIS uh, system. So we think that that management information system will actually help us improve the data that we have, the quality of data, but also the timeliness and reliability of that data. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So that's another plea for, for reliable data. Yeah. Um, and we see it we see it everywhere around the world, right? Yeah. Uh, that that uh, having reliable data and organizing that is uh, is is quite a challenge. Yeah. Yes. And now the new trick about there's also this emerging thing about that the data alone is not going. To because the data alone is good for decision making, the, there's something more that we need to do around the data. So in terms of ensuring that the data is uh, uh, sex disaggregated, for instance, uh, so that we can actually understand who is there, who is doing what, and actually even when we are talking about inclusive participation, we cannot just say that we, you know, people came, so we need to go bigger and target those vulnerable uh, groups that we actually want to bring on board. I think it's also accountability with your, what to do with that data. Exactly. I've been talking to an organization that collects a lot of data about water quality, but then they tell the community, yeah, sure, your water is dirty. And then they move on to the next yeah, page. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, how how is that going to help the community? Yeah. You know, if, if they just know, okay, my water is dirty, but yeah. What, what do you us? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is important. Yeah, we'll talk a bit more about this in the in the panel. I sure. think the uh, the experiences uh, uh, is something that we that we know uh, we know more about, and we'll we'll talk a bit more. Sure. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Thank Thanks, uh, Helena. Thank so, so, uh, so let's have the panel uh, panel up here, Helena. You're you you can take a seat here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And may I also invite Serene Malik? And Serene Malik is the, um, the coordinator of the African Civil Society Network on Water and Sanitation, a new and steering committee vice chair of the Sanitation and Water for All. Yeah. Um, and also I would like to invite Nick, Nick Hepworth. And Nick Hepworth works with Water Witness International a UK-based research institute on, on water and water data, right? But you'll say more about this, I'm sure, yourself. So I would like to, uh, to uh, uh, invite you to, to share your, your uh, thoughts with us. Nick is going to tell us a bit more about the research later on, the research that you, you've been doing on accountability. So we'd, we'd love to hear more. 
and and serene you wanted to share some information or some 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 of the views of how you see the role of uh your work getting the community voices yes to the global no. and back no absolutely please so i'm going to uh, apologize to Nick very quickly because he's already heard it like a hundred times. <laughs> Are you practiced? This bet really so much. It is. It's better every time. Okay, excellent. So I'm just going to say sorry to Nick who's <laughs> sitting right next to me. Uh, so thank you very much for, for, for taking the time to be here and thank you for this uh, session. So I think Helen gave a pretty good description of how these mutual accountability mechanisms work. I don't think I can give a better uh, uh, explanation as a matter of fact. This are uh, so the sanitation and water for all partnership. Yes, sets up these platforms in country at the local level, national level, you know, regional level, continental level, where we bring these various stakeholders, we make commitments, and we hold each other accountable in terms of how far you've gone uh, with these uh, commitments. For civil society, um, I always say it is important, and we are seeing that the South is getting a seat at the table. This is really important. Uh, that we are the ones to come and bring our stories, tell our stories. Um, we do not represent the people. I think that is important to note, but we represent the voice of people because government will tell you, no, we represent people. You represent voice. So I think that's an important uh, distinction. Yeah. Now, I was sharing with Tessa that before coming here, we had a quick uh, meeting, FGDs, with a group of women. And you tends to focus heavily on women and girls because they're the most left behind. Uh, that is 50% of the continent that is struggling, that still has the awful burden of uh, fetching uh, water as a role, as a responsibility, whether a social one, one that's been assigned socially, culturally. I mean, I'm sure you all know about this. But when I told them that, look, we're coming here and uh, what is it that you'd like, uh, you know, what would you like us to tell them? And first of all, they were like, okay, we didn't know you were coming here. I'm going to give the same message tomorrow at the UN 2023, that they're not aware that these meetings are taking place. But actually, in a nutshell, whether it was in the rural area or the urban area, the answer was the same. Access 24-7. I can't put it in another way. Yeah. That's it. Access 24-7 for themselves, for their children, whether it's at the household level, whether it's 500 meters um, away, access 24-7. Now... When we were sitting with the women, some of them, the children, had the eye, the, the white of the eye, which was a bit black, which are waterborne diseases. Uh, when we asked further details in terms of how many times did you take your children for, you know, uh, you know, to be treated, diarrhea, most of it, waterborne diseases. Uh, where are you fetching this water? Uh, unimproved sources. Yet the facility is there, but it's non-functional, and it goes on and on and on. Now, we talk about mutual accountability mechanisms between, yes, yeah. ourselves, uh, a civil society, I know, in, uh, in um, where is it? In South Africa, uh, civil society during the Commissa statement actually put there that we were going to hold ourselves more accountable for the results. Uh, and I think that's absolutely right, Lisa. Data comes, and then what do you do with it? You know, we'd go and do reports, we mine information, and we hardly ever restitute this information, apart from Nick. You know, so these are things that, you know, as ourselves, we have to, to think about, because government on more than one occasion has said, don't talk to us about accountability when you yourselves have a problem with your own accountability. So these are really, I think, important platforms in terms of, uh, if you're going to talk about that, you better be walking the talk or whatever the saying uh, goes. But more importantly, and I think this is what I need to share with you, we within our community have set up our systems and our mechanisms, but I can assure you that we are being held accountable by these women, by these people, by what is happening to their children, by what is happening to their, uh, uh, to their communities, to their livelihoods, whether it's at the climate change uh, uh, impact level, where we hear about community-led or uh, locally led solutions. We wonder how real is that because we're seeing mass migration into urban cities. Something is not working. But at the same time, when they look at you, they are holding us accountable. And I can assure you, we will answer for this. More and more, I think it's important to note that we being on the ground, 
Helen, Nick, myself, and many of you. There are, it's questions now of life. You know, we've talked about malnutrition, we've talked about stunting, we're talking about children that die at the age by who do not reach the age of five. We're talking about uh, maternal uh, uh, mortality. These are it's starting to take. It was always there, but there's a life and death dimension that is starting to become really real, and we will be held accountable for that. So that'll let you. I'll leave you think about that. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for being. Um, thanks for that. Do you? Do you go back to the same to the same communities, or or is is there a sort of a a a feed in mechanism that that the communities that didn't know, or the women, yeah. the women mm -hmm. that you spoke with, who didn't know about mm -hmm. uh, UN 2023, mm -hmm. that they hear that they hear back? Is Absolutely, there... yes, yeah. we do because we went into communities that we're already working in, some in the rural areas and some within the informal settlements. Um, so it was important that before we came here, it's not so much about Serene's views, you know, it no. was more in terms of, okay, we're going here, talk about your issues. What is it do you want us to go and tell the policymakers, yeah. you know, and the people yeah. that are going to be in Sweden or in New York, you know, what do you want them to, 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 to hear? So that's important. So when I do return, we will go back. Okay. Yeah. And tell them, okay, this is what has been more or less discussed. Uh, but in the meantime, we will continue providing you your psychosocial support. We will continue providing, uh, you know, your your engagement uh, mechanisms. We will continue empowering you uh, yeah. in different ways, building your resilience, which is really important. And that's the other thing. Uh, we talk a lot about these empowerment programs. Uh, but I think based on experience now, you need to address the root cause of disempowerment, which is distress. The distress of poverty, domestic abuse, being invisible before you start yeah. uh, uh, addressing the issues of empowerment. And we had been told that we had seen it amongst the women, the women that were most vulnerable, the girls that were most vulnerable to, to everything. Their mothers actually it was the cycle that was going with the mothers. And I think Helen can also attest to right. that. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's a whole cycle social yeah, aspect. absolutely that goes yeah like a vicious cycle that goes yeah, uh, yeah. and yeah. the and the and the stress that yeah. that the lack of absolutely services absolutely. the lack of clean water yeah. causes yeah for people yeah. okay so, yes. thank you accountability <laughs> are there any questions about this in uh, in the room or any questions on screen Anishka, are you are you um looking at the chat yeah Okay, if there are any, please, uh, please let me know. Please. Oh, sorry, just a, just a minute. We, we need to give you the microphone. For the, that's for the viewers back behind the screen. Thank you. So, um, it's all okay. <laughs> um, uh, I work for the Junior Water Prize of Ecuador. My name is Belen Vallejo. Uh, and when you say about empowerment, that you cannot empower, for example, young people when they don't have the background, for example, for scientific projects. And when we come here and say to an international contest, there is not this background. And I am just talking about the young people. Um, and I think um, the North need to understand that and need to understand that our problems have and other issues that we need to solve at first, afterwards, we can really understand that we can uh, uh, we can go to the sustainability, uh, sustainability, water management, and so on, so on. But there are, are, are really important things that need to be, um, need to be uh, focused on at first. Um, uh, and uh, the other thing that, uh, that I also see is uh, how we can ask so much for the people that they don't have also the, the basic needs are covered. And also these social aspects that are related. I think in our South countries, that is the problem because for that we don't have water, we don't have sanitation. And I, need the, I think this is important to say, okay, we need to figure out the whole picture of the problem, 
not just about water. So, so if I understand correctly, you're saying both we need people need to need to be educated to be empowered. That's that was the first part of your yeah. point. Mm -hmm. I think we need to have education, and um, we need to also uh, be more open about the situation of South countries. Yeah, because sometimes it's like uh, NGOs or international cooperation wants to give us a solution, but how the solution are going to work if the situation is not understood? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think and that's a that's a very that's a very strong plea yeah. to understand the context which uh, Riyadh was also talking yeah. about. Yes, indeed. Any, I, I see, I see nodding here. Is, is, is that what you, do you recognize what, what's being said? Absolutely. She's absolutely right. Context is really important. Understanding the power dynamics in a country is really important. Yeah. Uh, South is about the checklist. There's a checklist that you need to have. What you're going to hear at the top is not necessarily what you're going to get at the bottom, nothing is ever linear, you know. So these are some of the things one has to be cognizant of. Uh, and in fact, when you engage with women, let me tell you, these meetings were had on a Saturday afternoon. There was no way I was getting any woman to sit with us for about an hour on a weekday. No, they're working. Yeah, they're working. Yeah, they're working. So we had to access to uh, or invite them, you know, for at, in, in the middle of one of their livelihood type of activities because those are the women that you know are really affected we have the gatekeepers the ones that usually come for the meetings but how sure are you that message is actually going back so we know each other well uh so i always say you have to understand the socialization of people as well before you do the intervention yeah. Ellen, you know this isn't it when is the best time to get the women so saturday afternoon during these uh, these uh, uh pyramid scheme type of uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> activities yeah, when, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. At the church. When, when do you when yeah. do you talk to people? When yeah. do, when do you go to 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 meet the people you work with? And sometimes, if you're, for instance, if you're dealing with women vendors, yeah. and uh, these women vendors are vending food, you can't have a meeting at this exactly. time. Probably they are serving breakfasts. You can't have it at lunch time. You can't have it at four. So you have to find time in between. So even when you're talking about women, it's not a homogeneous group. Yeah. So it will change by trade. It will change mm -hmm. by location. If they are urban, if they are rural, probably in the morning, they've gone to the gardens and then you'll see them around three after they have served food. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, 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 it's very dynamic, really. It's very dynamic. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's really important to understand. Yes, like I agree. Context is really, really yeah. important. Who plays what role? What are the power dynamics? Who are the gatekeepers? Who are your respondents? Mm -hmm. You know, because all these forms part and parcel of accountability. Most likely you've had uh, focus group discussions where it was uh, the father figure and all his other relatives, whereby now you need to go further down the river to see who is, you know, who is it that I should have actually been having conversation yes. with? Yeah. So I think we have to be alive yeah. to these you know yeah. like i think helen is right it's not yeah. one monolithic block you right. know, it's not one single story so right. we have to open our minds a bit to that yeah. and to get to get an insight into Absolutely. into the data and and the experience yeah. as as you were saying before yeah. because the the data alone doesn't yeah. doesn't allow for that yeah i'm i i have a question about that to, to nick are you do you have a way of of uh Looking at data, you're going to tell us about your research in a bit, but more in general, when doing research from, from your organization, is there a way to actually, you need the mic. Nick needs the mic. Thank you. Thank, uh, thanks for Sven helping us out. Thanks. Sven. So uh, is there a way to, to actually look at the context of, of the data that, that you work with, or is it more big data and and uh, organizing that um, that's a really good question no no we very much uh use data from the ground up so it's, it's reflecting the realities of, of of local communities uh the challenges they face based on qualitative evidence okay. uh, but supplemented by quantitative evidence and monitoring where where that's useful okay. uh, using appropriate ap approaches okay. to to give legitimacy to their to 
to their arguments. Excellent. So you so you make a combination. Sure, we triangulate between you know, local realities uh, and more traditional types of uh, gathering evidence about water problems. Excellent. Okay, thanks. And you'll tell us a bit more about the uh, about the research and your institute in a in a bit. I would very much like to. You have two questions. Okay, we'll give you uh, we'll we'll give you the mic. Thanks, Nick. I'll pass on the mic so you can. There are two online question questions. One is coming from uh, Fiola. She's working for the Hunger Project in Uganda, and she's asking: question, Communities live forever, and involving them in such processes is the best way to create sustainable transformation. How have you set up? mechanisms of ensuring that these communities can mobilize themselves and lead change independently. And then there's a question specifically for Serene. Thanks Malik for the great presentation. Great point on the accountability from CSOs, very critical indeed. Yeah. I would like to ask you in the spirit of reaching the furthest behind first and leaving no one behind, how can we position and re engineer the position of rural women, young mothers, disabled persons in issues of access to water resources as civil society. And this question is coming from Gerald Kato, who is also working for the Hunger Project in Uganda, and he's the Right to Grow coordinator. Okay. So two great questions coming from Hunger Project Uganda. <laughs> Thank you so much that you're you're with us this morning. Active people. <laughs> thanks, thanks for listening. Uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, Colleagues, so who would like to who would like to answer this? I can start uh, with uh, how do you ensure that there's sustainability? I think in the spirit of accountability, uh, in in and mutual accountability in that respect, even as a civil society that come from the local context, we actually have to push it down further. We have to create community champions that can actually go on and run with the initiatives and work on solving their own issues. So the kind of, of advocacy that we are promoting within Right to Grow is advocacy with the people, but also they have to be part of the process. So there are processes where we actually work with them and be ahead of them if you're doing policy, you know, policy advocacy at the highest level, but then the people must be at the forefront. So we are creating community champions that are, can actually sustain uh, these initiatives long after we've left. Excellent, thank you. Um, I think in terms of civil society accountability, let me start with that. Uh, look, on the continent, there've been the, this extraordinary work that is being done by various networks which is known as the CSO Sector Annual Performance Reports. Uh, I know Uganda does it, Wasnet does it, uh, Tanzania does it, Kenya does it. And that was actually the start towards accountability. How accountable are we? So every year you have these networks that send out, you know, the sophisticated questionnaires uh, or some very rustic ones, <laughs> rudimentary ones, asking how much did you get? How much did you spend? where did you spend it and what did you spend it on? It's as simple as that. That information is gathered and usually presented at these joint sector reviews. So that is really the first way how we as civil society try and strengthen a bit our accountability uh, by showing uh, a united front and you know reporting. Uh, and these days, I know that some networks have gotten a bit aggressive, mainly with INGOs who are usually very reluctant about reporting how much they actually get, how much they're spending, where, why. Uh, so there is a bit of a uh, very passive aggressive naming and shaming kind of <laughs> initiative that's taking place. But having said that, that is uh, one way of going. Now for the second question, we, we, as a student of European history, okay, Europe, what was the first thing that Europe did? You invested in your rural areas. You brought service delivery to your rural areas. The answer is the same. We need to bring more investments. We need to bring service <clears throat> delivery. You need to bring water, uh, health, education to 
the rural area. That is really what we need to be pushing for. Because we see in the rural area, for example, uh, I know there are a lot of academic papers, I think, that have been written about it, that you, know, you see a four times increase or something. That is what lifts economic development and what promotes economic development also supports women in general. Because we know in rural area, that's where you have early marriages, uh, early teen pregnancies, girls not going to uh, uh, school because she has to go fetch water, she has to go cut firewood. She, I mean, so I think the answer is, let us find a way of bringing service delivery to the rural area, whether through public uh, private partnerships, whether through uh, putting pressure on governments, you know, to make sure that funding investments are made within the rural area, uh, whether uh, civil society work, you know, complementing, you know, the work that is being done. But I, I believe that is one of the key, uh, <laughs> based on history, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I know there's a historian sitting as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll take. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Serene. Thanks, thanks for this strong plea. Um, I have one more question, and then we'll then we'll go over to Nick, please. So pass the mic. Thank you. I liked very much your observation that Europe invested in the rural areas because that's true, but you have to take an account that if you talk about farmers, yeah. they started with a hand dug well and a rope in the bucket. And then they climbed, they became more, they earned, they earned more, they had more economic, they had more income. And with that income, they could pay taxes. And with the taxes, we pay the pipe systems in, in, in Holland and in Europe, right? So I think that is a critical message for Africa also. If you want to develop the rural areas, you have to start with farm wells, every farm should have their own water source. If they don't have a pipe system, they start with a water source. And that is, of course, the big challenge because it's too expensive in general. Mm -hmm. So that is a technical challenge. And that is where we have a lot of information and ideas on how to reduce the cost of farm wells. But we can discuss that later. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, and I also hear you some, saying something else, uh, taxes, right? Uh, and of course, people are only willing to pay taxes if they get the services. Yeah. So that's a that's a more or less of a vicious cycle, but but, but something important. Eh? Public private partnerships. You need to have the government needs to be able to provide, and needs to be a trustworthy partner yes. in providing. So these are uh, these are some of the things that we're talking about. Okay, if reading reading the the posts that you put up. These are the, the important points that you've already identified as well and that we've delved into a bit more, um, uh, saying if, uh, if, if not the voice and, and therefore interests of ultimate stakeholders is not included if we don't uh, look at the voice uh, and, and listen to the local voices. Ownership and willingness to pay. So in fact, uh, we've, we've talked about services and, and you've said so, uh, Helena, as well that people are willing to pay uh, for services and are able to pay, we've, we've seen in, uh, in, in Bangladesh, um, but these services need to be available and they need to be affordable, of course, and reliable. Um, I'll read out one more because it is the only means to make progress towards water justice. Um, and I, I think that holds very true as well. Um, so indeed, I would like to uh, invite Nick, you're, you're going to share some of the uh, findings of the research that you're doing or, ha or have yeah. been doing. Yeah, uh, thanks Tessa and, and thanks for the invitation to a really in, important and interesting session. Uh, my name is Nick Ketworth. I lead the work uh, of a, an organization called Water Witness International. We're based in Edinburgh and we lead action, research and advocacy for shared water security. Um, so I, I think it's, I hope it's widely accepted that our global water crisis is, a, is, a, is really a crisis of abysmal governance. Yeah, there's enough water for everybody. There's technologies there to solve the problems. We're just not very good at governing, sharing, protecting, or investing in the water to get it to where it needs to be. And it's the poor and marginalized that tend to suffer as a result. They get the shitty water services. They get the degraded and depleted resources. 
and they're hammered by droughts and floods because they're poor, they're marginalized, right? Their voices aren't prioritized by use the word elites, the elites that benefit from the status quo, right? Those in power don't prioritize the needs of the marginalized. And so strategies that try and address that power imbalance and make sure that the realities of the people affected by this problem are heard, and that their voices are listened to, seem, seem a really, intuitively seem a really good strategy to solve, to start to move the bar on the crisis, right? And there's a whole bunch of NGOs and organizations oh, go back, along the bottom here that have been trying to use these approaches, calling it citizen voice, social accountability. For the past, particularly 10, 15 years, there's been a lot of activity investment in trying to do that, trying to make sure that the communities most badly affected by these problems can speak truth to power and hold duty bearers to account for, 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 for better services, better governance. Um, and amongst those organizations is Water Witness and, and Anu. And we, we, found, we found glimmers of, of hope in that work, right? In, there are cases and examples where it does work. You know, communities that are, are affected by horrendous pollution in rivers that they rely on for, for domestic supply, turning up in a ministry meeting demanding enforcement of pollution control law. Um, Collectives of civil societies demanding better budget allocation uh, and doing budget analysis and tracking for, for rural wash services and getting success in, in, in more allocation of, of, of budget to those problems and making sure those budgets don't leak. It also works at a global scale and, and through networks and bringing evidence from the field of how women in particular are, are, are lacking uh, wash services in global supply chains or communities are being polluted through, through fashion or, or mining, uh, increasingly is getting traction in, in some of the policy responses. And Serene's a, a, a real powerhouse in some of that work. There's actually led to a, a new global declaration on fair water footprints, um, which we can talk more about. Um, so these organizations uh, actually meeting at Stockholm, sharing ideas of what works, what doesn't, um, quickly realized that there were some big knowledge gaps in how we approach this opportunity. Um, you know, we'd all seen glimmers of success and hope, and in terms of moving the bar on SDG 6, it's a really exciting strategy, um, but some real challenges in how you do it. You know, how do you genuinely stimulate and sustain citizen voice for change? I think, I think the question from the, from the field was, or from Uganda was a good one. In lots of places, communities aren't organized, right? And that's part of the problem. So how, how do you begin to, to support communities that are in a desperate state uh, with lots of different priorities to, to activate better governance on water? Um, how do you do that whilst maintaining legitimacy for those community voices? So not, you're not speaking for them, you're not speaking on their behalf, you're supporting them to speak. Uh, and uh, some challenges there, right? Also, what do governments listen to? There's lots of examples of where there's great advocacy and evidence. Government or duty bearers, who cares, right? There's no change, there's no response. Uh, so what makes governments and governance actually listen to the, to the voices that are being raised? And then thirdly, how do you support these processes, which are essentially political, from an external viewpoint, from an NGO from Edinburgh or, or a new based in Nairobi, how do you legitimately support these political processes in, in countries where sometimes politically very fraught, right? Um, and we'll rightly say, why, why have we got a US foundation raising, rab raising mobs uh, demanding change in these, in these urban slums? So lots of questions about legitimacy and, and how you actually fund and sustain these processes of change. And so the, the consortium of interested parties that are new, Water Aid, Sanitation Water for All, Oxfam, IDS, Water Witness came together to form the Accountability for Water Partnership. And we got some funding from the Hewlett Foundation to answer these questions through on the ground research in Tanzania, Ethiopia, 
Kenya, Liberia, and Zambia, working with not PhDs parachuted in, but organizations working on the ground, helping them do research on these issues. Uh, we also undertook a global evidence review of all, all the literature on this topic over the past 20 years to see what that would tell us. So formal evaluations and academic research. Uh, and we also launched some cross-country research, a massive survey of households. So what do, what do people know and do and understand about accountability and key informants with duty bearers and, and NGOs and others. Uh, we're, we're coming to the end of that research phase and, and about to move into the outreach and creating the legacy of that work. So this knowledge about how you embed accountability can be used by donors, by NGOs, by communities themselves, and by governments. And what's, what's refreshing and hopeful is that lots of governments and ministries are desperate for this kind of knowledge. You know, how do we better listen to the communities we're trying to serve? Um, so what do we find? A quick couple of highlights from the country-led research. Um, so this is the work that Mary did in, in Kenya about accountability of water service providers to communities. Um, she found that one of the big problems was that um, communities, if there is a problem, they, they don't know what to do about it. So how do they, what are their rights? And who do they, who do they complain to? That, you know, it's old fashioned to think about the needs for awareness, but if you're not aware of where to raise your voice to, you're not gonna raise your voice. Um, so um, it certainly wasn't a lack of time. Uh, some cases where they'd raised an issue and there's no response. So issues around standards of service there. Um, and moving on to Ethiopia, some fantastic research looking at uh, water resource development of a rice, uh, a big rice uh, plantation investment by Sabistar, Saudi Star in Gambella, uh, where the community were promised benefits from the damming of their river. Um, but the research shows that all along, the community was seen as a passive actor. So their voice, voices weren't really taken into consideration. It was more economic growth and export revenue, which is the heart of the investment. And that led to problems in terms of access to that river water for the communities and the environment. Problems with weak enforcement mechanisms and coordination. And interestingly, what the researcher found was that although in this place, the communities were uh, got, a, got a, a raw deal, the lessons they learned about being mis, uh, the misinformation around this development, they shared that with other communities in Ethiopia, uh, which meant that they were able to resist similar sorts of development, which wouldn't wouldn't benefit them. Um, so this country level research is 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 coming to a conclusion, and we're, we're gleaning the nuggets of the gold dust of uh, for for policy advocacy around it. In terms of the evidence review, and there should be a title on this slide about the evidence review, the evidence review allowed allow us to build a theory of change about how this works, right? So the problem is that poor service delivery governance in WASH uh, and water resource management is undermining development, social and economic progress. There's a range of interventions to build voice, social accountability monitoring, budget analysis, evidence-based advocacy, and then statutory complaints mechanisms, statutory complaints mechanisms. Um, these interventions should, if they're successful, have impact for better services and governance. But we screen the evidence factors. Uh, so what is the evidence that they do work and what are the factors that lead to their success? Okay, so there were over, over 1200 bits of literature that we screened for this knowledge. Uh, and it's it's available on a, a, a knowledge hub on, a, on on the accountability portal website, and it's it's dynamite for you know it's 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 brilliant for those people like you in this room that are interested in this agenda because it it, it gives us lots of insights of what to think about. The headline is that these approaches are amazingly successful in getting positive outcomes for SDG six. Eighty percent of the accounts reported positive change as a result of stronger accountability. That's great return on investment for donors, right? It's amazing. Um, and again, the Knowledge Hub tracks and shows where the, the outcomes lie. 
the work, and the slide gets a bit complicated here, but because this stuff is complicated, right? But, but this is a map of all the factors that affect the success of these types of interventions, right? If you're interested in raising citizen voice and improving accountability, these are the things you want to think about that either get in the way or make it successful. Uh, a few key observations. These changes don't happen overnight. Long-term long -term engagement, right? It's bargaining for change. So don't expect a quick hit. It's, it's a long haul, right? 10 years probably to get to move the bar. Um, and that is important for external support. So donors that do funding cycles over three years and have a log frame, guess what? You're not, you're not gonna see the political change in that time scale. Um, what we saw across almost all the interventions that it was the, it was the quality of the and the dedication of the human resources involved that the facilitator from the NGOs or civil society, which determined, which was really important for the success of the intervention. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a bit of a no-brainer, but it was clear from the evidence that that you need people who are skilled enough to do this because they need to know the technical stuff that this lady referred to. Yeah, so they need to have the technical breadth of knowledge around water issues. They need to know how to work with communities and they need to know how to work with ministers and politicians, right? So that, that skill set is needed for this work. And it's, it's rare. And when it's there, it gets snapped up to go and work for the World Bank or, or, or a new or water winner. Um, so there's a skill base that needs to be there. Um, another massive problem external to the interventions was in many countries, when you talk about water quality or water services or, or pollution or, or, or water allocation and environmental protection, there's six or seven different agencies or authorities that have a responsibility for that, right? Um, Kenya's a good example, right? So you've got the, the, you've got the National Environment Protection Authority, uh, sorry, NEMA, responsible for environmental regulation, which includes abstraction and discharge. But you've also got the water resource management authorities and catchment authorities, but also the, the local environmental uh, health office responsible for some of these issues. So if there's a problem, you've got this, these overlapping mandates, which means that it's very difficult to, to pinpoint accountability, right? And that's a problem across, across the world where these, the lack of clarity in who's actually responsible for getting these things done is a problem. Um, and the donors have a lot to, to, are to blame for lots of that because they set up these institutions and basically do photocopy regulations and take them from country to country to set up new institutions for some of this work. Um, and I know because I know some of the consultants that do that. So ambiguous institutional responsibilities are a big barrier to accountability. Um, and across the board, the quality and independence of the media plays a really important role in this, in, in amplifying voice and tenacity in demanding change from duty bearers. And in most, well, a lot of countries, media is pay to play. So there's not enough public interest journalism to make this work. So, as I said, there's, there's a lot of complexity here. There's a lot of evidence to share. And, and we were chatting before, what, what's gonna be most useful for you, this audience from this? And so do come and talk. If, if the particular questions you've got about this agenda, uh, we can help you delve into the evidence we've got. Again, the, the punchline is this holds real promise. For those of us that wanna hit well, all of us want to hit SDG six, right? But for those that want to invest in interventions to get us there at different scales, strengthening accountability is a really exciting way to go, right? Uh, and there's lots of organisations that can can help and are on hand to to do that. Um, emerging priorities, as I mentioned, if communities don't know their rights or who is responsible, accountability is not going to work address this ambiguity in the statutory responsibilities around water security and climate change, so people know who's accountable. And then this idea that civil society is there to hold people to account in many places is a fantasy. There simply aren't the human and financial resources for that activity to take place. And when they are, they're often dragged into endless meetings about 
X, Y, Z that aren't local priorities, they're donors priorities. So what we're trying to do is set up a strategic support facility, a global support facility, legal, technical, financial support for civil society to do this work properly over the long term. And we're speaking to some of the donors about that. At the moment, it's called SDG6 Accountability Facility. Could change its name. Um, and then probably most importantly, you know, this, the, the freedom of civil society and communities to speak out on issues is being shut down progressively, globally. Uh, and there's some great work by uh, the Centre for Democracy in the States, which tracked that. And in over 60 territories, including the UK, the, the civic space for this debate to happen is being squeezed. Uh, so we need to respond to that as a community uh, so that these processes can happen. Next steps, um, we're in the detailed analysis and outreach phase. There will be strategies at national, regional, global scale to strengthen accountability for water, the facility and support for the community of practice on this, um, which is extremely inclusive and, and open and welcoming. So get in touch and, and you, can, you can, we'd love to learn from you and work with you. How else to be involved? We're, we're running a phase two of the professional research fellowships. Uh, you can host a professional research fellow that gets support from the uh, Institute of Development Studies in Sussex and Partnership for Social Governance Research in Kenya on how to do research. Uh, become a national or global advisor on the work or become a, a global learning partner so you can get regular updates and briefing notes on, on what this all means. Thanks. Sorry, I hope I'm taking too much time there, but there's a lot to get out. Thanks for that. That was incredibly in, insightful. And um, I think I think you were saying bargaining for change is something that that takes, as, as we say in Dutch, takes a long breath. Um, and this is something to keep in mind. And 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 also the need to organize this. You can't leave it to individuals who are uh, uh, heavenly Burden, burdened with with chores and work uh, and 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 families uh, family care as well so getting getting it organized because it's not a voluntary thing that you do on the side right um so thanks for that we we also have a question uh in the app from uh, from judith omundi who works for the danish uh, people's aid and it's a bit of a provocative question to you uh, nick saying that naming and shaming of the service providers uh, in Kenya seems to work better than the traditional accountability mechanisms. Is, do, you, do you come across, hell yes, <laughs> hell yes, Judith. <laughs> but do you come across this and, and how do you yeah. navigate this? I mean, I think, uh, you know, if we think about account social accountability takes many forms, right? So there's yeah. a ladder of using formal grievance mechanisms, Naming and shaming, working with the media, putting the spotlight on, uh, you know, on on abuse of power or or lack of accountable leadership in the sector, um, and legal accountability. So we've got we've got a bunch of cases now where communities are have tried and failed truth to power. It's now power to power using the courts to to get yeah. their to get their rights yeah. to get accountability. So I mean, it's a whole spectrum, and whole and spectrum. we need to learn what works and when and and why. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, what, what works when, why, and where? I, I think we go back to the context again. Yeah, thanks so much. Very, very, very insightful. Are there any questions? Any other questions? We've heard a lot. Lisa. Just one sec, thank you. Yeah. We moved from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals. And I really embraced the change that we made for SDG 6, because it was about safely managed drinking water, yeah. which means E. coli free drinking water. I looked at your slides, Nick, and impact, it says improved water. Improved water is not safely managed water yet. So to what extent do the partners within this coalition actually measure their contribution to safely managed drinking water? And to what extent do you include safely managed drinking water in your reporting 
in your impact data and also within your accountability standards. Thanks, thanks, Lisa. So maybe, uh, yeah, maybe maybe a question to you all. Thanks. Yeah, I think I'll just uh, say that uh, depending from the context, you have where there's practically nothing, so you you cannot start with the end of the ladder. So we're actually moving gradually. Uh, if you look at the numbers, if you look at the context, for instance, if you look at how Ugandan government has been reporting. Our reporting initially was on basic and we're doing well we're in the 70s. When we went to safely manage uh, water, then we actually down to, to the 20s. So yeah, we are, it's work in progress, really. Yeah. Work in progress. It's a bit of ego no, it's, <laughs> no, no, it's not evil, it's provocative. And we need, we, we need that because it's, yeah. it's bloody serious. Yeah, to, to, it's to a push us, you know, to push the bar up that we, we actually to, we looking push at. The bar up. Good for you. Yeah. 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 I think if, if I can, it, it flags, it, it raises questions about roles and responsibilities. I mean, the, the days of NGOs from, from, from the UK going to be responsible for safely managed drinking water in Africa are over. That's, that's yeah. neo-colonialist. What, what we're interested in is helping citizens demand safely managed drinking water from their governments and their service providers, right? So, so um, helping them articulate and understand what that means and tracking whether it's delivered against and, and making sure that, that service providers and governments are in a position to respond. So, so it's a really good question, but it's not, it's not for us to determine. You know, it, it's about making sure that there is demand and response to that need for safety managed drinking water and that the indicators are shared in those countries where it's needed and reported against. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Nick. Thanks. I, and I, I, I really like the distinction being made between uh, uh, the, the, the ways of working before and now helping citizens to demand. This is to the demand themselves. I think this is an important distinction. And you, you made the same uh, yeah. saying, we don't represent, we, but we give a voice or we pass on yeah. messages, et cetera. Thanks. Oh, sorry, sorry. You've, you've had the floor a couple of times already. So I'm going, first going to give the lady and then I'll get back to you. Sorry. Hi, good. Morning, my name is Marjolein Wilmink and I just joined Max uh, Foundation. Um, I have a question slash remark. Um, I used to work years ago with Shack Dwellers International, you might know them, and their very effective way to reach change was not to claim only, but also to map actually what resources communities put on the table themselves. What assets do they put on the table themselves? Because then you get a place around the table so it's not claiming it's negotiating and it's also saying like hey this is what we put in ourselves knowing that governments can't solve it all because government are resource poor and yeah we can claim but it's also very, very important to say like what can we contribute ourselves and that helped them very much to to influence and to be a voice around the table rather than only saying you have to solve it for us what can we solve ourselves also with assets with financial means with resources and then evidence is very important to really map that out what, what do we have here we are not poor and we are not kind of helpless but have we it? have a we have something yeah thank you oh, so a remark thank you yeah yes thank you okay i i remember i saw in india that the communities were a lot more involved in giving from their own resources. I remember that was the first time we went to a community meeting where the, they had prepared lunch for us, whereby where we come from, you prepare lunch for them. So there was, you're right, the understanding we still need to inculcate in some of our communities that this is for you. It, you know, it's not what we can, you know, what is it what we can do for you, but what you can do, you know, for yourselves. Uh, and I think those are some of the things in terms of bigger conversations on in terms of aid dependency, you know, how people perceive uh, uh, aid and uh, uh, assistance. And I think some of the work that is being done, whether by Nick and by, by Helen, is really important in terms of trying to get that shift 
to take place where we are trying to get, you know, communities to be a little bit, be more responsible, you know, uh, pursue a bit more of your own individual sovereignty as well when you're doing this kind of uh, work. But I know it's a, it's a big discussion, but I think there are a lot of cultural elements to it as well. Yeah. Nick, do you want to say something or? Um, it's a bit controversial. Um, I think that I think the development community has got a got a lot of responsibility in in whether communities are passive or or, or are active. Uh, I think waves of support over the over the over the decades as as so initiative overload for lots of communities and uh, you know um, can be passive on some of these issues and, and expect NGOs to step in. Um, it's a problem, right? It's 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 a problem when the power that there there are such uh, systemic power imbalances out there that it's a really hard one to navigate, right? A lot of the, a lot of getting change, negotiating change depends on you speaking in my language or or being able to write stuff or being able to do a PowerPoint presentation, right? So that so it 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 negates engagement by a whole sector. Of, of community that's changing through things like mobile phones and you know the training that, that that some of serene's partners is doing to to help women in particular articulate and give them the confidence to come and articulate their issues in forums like this um yeah but it's uh it's a it's a journey um i must say i think i think the lack of representation of the people that we're talking about who, who suffer most from the global water crisis in forums like this is a bit of a scandal and that we need to look at the the, the inclusiveness of events like stockholm yeah, yeah, I, I I absolutely agree, and I know I know some of the people in the audience have have strong feelings about this as well, and they and and they should because they're right. Absolutely, thank you so much. All right, before we wrap up, we have one more uh, video, um, a video message. I'm looking at our friends from the support, so we have uh, we have a message from uh, from our fourth speaker, uh, Henk Alvink, who has uh, sent us something on tape. Hello, Henk Alving, Special Envoy for International Water Affairs for the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And I was asked to address two topics. One, how local communities across the world are empowered to take action in the context of water security, especially watch. One example comes from an innovative program we launched a couple of years ago in Asia, in the three cities of Chennai in India, Kuma in Bangladesh, and Samara in Indonesia. The program is called Water as Leverage, really using water as a catalyst for inclusion, for partnerships and collaboration from the ground up in these communities to take actions that can be scaled and replicated. Water as Leverage projects are now being implemented and scaled, not only in these cities, but across their countries and across the world. And it's the communities that lead and help determine not only what the needs are, but also design and co-design with the experts and international partners, how to move ahead and scale those implementations. The second thing I was asked, how that could inform locally led action, inclusion and partnership next year's UN 2023 Water Conference. A conference aimed at changing the world. Well, conferences don't change the world. The change is on us. We have the responsibility to take concerted action across every sector and silo in the world, across nations, across regions, to make sure that the commitments and actions that we take really have an impact on the lives and livelihoods of the most vulnerable. That is what the conference is about, and that is why these innovative practices, these inclusive approaches, community-led, from the ground up, taking water and water and sanitation and hygiene as serious leverage for sustainable development and climate action to the conference and beyond. The outcome of the conference is the Water Action Deck Agenda, and this Water Action Agenda will bring together all the commitments of the world, and we hope they're massive but also transformative and catalytic, so we can implement and scale and replicate for a true watershed moment. I look forward to your ideas, your suggestions, but also your commitments and partnership at any scale across every level. So the leadership of the world and the leadership from the communities can really unite hands and forces to make next year's conference a true watershed moment. Thank you. Well, thanks, Hank. Thanks, thanks for those uh, inspiring words. And uh, 
I think I think in this session uh, this morning we we have talked about getting the South at the table, and I I'm 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 really uh, inspired by by the examples you've been giving of of that is happening more and more, holding accountable and and helping people to to hold their own governments accountable, and how to make governments listen, and I think this is. Uh, we're, we're, we're at the start of this, and uh, hopefully with your uh, research, uh, Nick, and your recommendations, experiences from the field, looking at, at local to global, um, we, can, uh, we can make this happen. So this conversation is not over yet. It's something that we have to keep on doing, and uh, we've been instructed to, uh, to, to do so also at uh, UN Water 2023. If we get the visa. Uh, if you get the visa. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Yeah, about you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the session. Yeah. Thanks at home. <laughs> Thank you.